Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning, those who are watching online as well, and a special welcome to Pastor Doug Anderson as he shares God's word with us today. Um, just a couple of small announcements, nothing big. I don't know who noticed the flowers this morning coming into the church, but they look beautiful with the fresh rain on them, and uh, it's a really, uh, for me, it put my mind in the right place to see all that beauty just driving in the driveway. And uh, I'd like to thank the people who are involved with that. Um, also, one small announcement. Um, as you know, our Sunday school, regular Sunday school program has ran its course for the season, and now we have a summer Sunday school program. And it's generally designed just to give those who regularly teach a, a break from teaching Sunday school. But uh, that being said then, if you wanted to do a Sunday during the summer holidays, uh, feel free to contact me or Kelly Evercamp and uh, we can slot you into a place uh, uh, to teach uh, a particular lesson. We have all the material all laid out already, so if you would consider that. Um, no further announcements, let's start our time of worship. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 89. Holy God, your faithful love toward us never ends. It is as sure and dependable as the sky over our heads. We praise you. We have gathered together in this place to offer you our worship and our thanksgiving, to declare to any who will listen that you are our God and that we are your people. May your spirit be at work among us as we worship, opening our eyes to the light of your presence in this place. To you alone, faithful creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be all glory and honor now and forever. Amen. Let us continue to stand singing to God be the glory. He gave 
gave us his son who yielded life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice oh come to the father through jesus my son and give him the glory great things he has done virgin, the purchase of blood to every believer the promise of god the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. gather here this morning at the invitation of God and he welcomes us as his people and greets us as his own. To the church in Woodstock, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ.
As we gather together in God's presence to worship him, we become aware of our own need and our the sin in our life, and so it is appropriate to pause the prayer of confession. Let's pray together. Loving and sustaining God, you call us to obedience, to follow you in all things, to give up all things we cling to, and to give ourselves wholeheartedly to your purposes. We confess that we don't always find this easy to do. We confess that it is often very difficult to let go of the things we love. But we also know that you never ask us, ask more of us than what is possible, and that you stand ready at all times to sustain us and to provide everything we need. Give us courage to faithfully follow your leading, even when we cannot see the outcome even when the path you call us to seems impossible to comprehend. Help us to trust you in all things, to let go of everything that would stand in the way of wholehearted obedience to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. When we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us. We, we, are, we read, God does not give us up to temptations and ways of the world, but shelters us with love, with hope, with grace. We are forgiven people. Our songs of joy are lifted to the one who forgives us and saves us. Thanks be to God. Amen. In response, let's sing the song, I Stand Amazed. I'll be leading you in our prayers for the people, but before we do that, um, I received word last night that Joanne Dunawal passed away yesterday morning, and the funeral will be, he will be held in Ingersoll CRC, as far as I know, but I don't know, have any other details at this point in time. Let's come to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time as a church family to praise your holy name. We acknowledge your greatness, and we stand in awe of your wonderful creation. Please help us to be good stewards of all that you have entrusted to us, not only this earth, but our time, talents, and treasures. We thank you for the freedom that we have to worship you each Sunday, and we are mindful of those that are persecuted for worshiping you. Sustain them and grant them your Holy Spirit as they gather in secret. We are thankful for the rains that have brought relief to some of the areas in Canada that have been affected by wildfires, and we ask for continued blessings and safeties on all those striving to, to tame the fires. We are grateful for the work that these individuals are doing, putting in many hours of work in conditions that are very difficult. 
We pray for many that have been displaced from their homes due to fires, floods, and other natural disasters. Also for many who have had to flee because of wars between nations or between factions within a nation. We pray for peace where there is conflict. We pray for safety, security, and health for those who have left their homes behind. We ask for your blessing upon the leaders of this church. Give each of us what we stand in need of as we seek to carry out your work in this church. Thank you for every volunteer that helps out with all of the programs and activities of this church, not only on Sundays, but also during the week. As church family, we mourn alongside the Wesselson family with the son, Death of Frida, mother, mother of Lloyd and Elaine, grandmother of Ryan and Erica and their children. May God give this family comfort as they celebrate her life. We also remember and pray for the family of Joanne Dunawald as they mourn her passing. May they also be blessed with many fond memories of this child of yours, her smile which could light up a room, her enthusiasm which could make you forget your own issues and problems. We continue to pray for peace and comfort for Bill Drewwarder as he continues at the Secure House. We pray for his family as they walk this difficult path in our Savior's hand. We also pray for our students who have finished another school year. May those seeking summer employment find meaningful work. And we pray for safety for all those who are traveling this summer or staying at home. And as we now open your holy word, we ask for your blessing upon this reading. Give Pastor Anderson clarity as he preaches and give us open hearts and minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our reading this morning is from uh, Philippians 3, verse 17, to chapter 4, verse 3. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our body, our lowly bodies, so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and, and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Eudodia and I plead with Sintishi to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have, con have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers who names, whose names are in the book of life. This is the word of the Lord.
Most of us, I assume, celebrated Canada Day yesterday. Perhaps you went to the fireworks. Perhaps you had some gatherings of some sort or maybe a family trip. I see a lot of people are away on this long weekend. It's an opportunity to think about the country we are part of and we are grateful for many things. The freedoms that we have, the opportunity to gather for worship, the wealth our country has, even though we may struggle with some of the things that are happening and the changes taking place, we are still grateful. And yet as we think about that, the citizenship we have here is not our true citizenship. That lies in Christ alone. In Christ, we celebrate our true citizenship as we wait his transformation. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, and we can see how Paul addresses this issue. So first, in Christ, we celebrate our true citizenship, verses 17 and 19. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, at, and just as you have a model on us, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I've often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. Now as you look at that, it, it seems kind of obvious there's no word citizenship in those first few verses, is there? Ah, but there's something hidden in it. When you look at this letter, we need a bit of background. The city of Philippi, as you probably know, although it is in Greece, was a Roman city. It was formed about a hundred years before Paul, approximately, when a legion was discharged, and as they often did, they gave them land, and this happened to be the place that the city of Philippi was. So most of the original citizens were Romans, and they took great pride in their citizenship. And while Paul's day, there were other Greeks and others who came in, it was still a Roman citizen, or uh, city proud of their citizenship. Now Paul went there on his second missionary journey and established the church and then went on. At some point he got arrested and so the church at Philippi to help him out sent him some money. You can see that if you read chapter 4 he gives thanks to the gift that they sent him. But most of the letter concerns something he heard from Epaphroditus that there was this problem developing. It hadn't blown up yet but there was strife among the congregation. And so most of the letter deals with that, and it creates a backdrop for us. So if you were to go back to the beginning of the letter, chapter 1, the basic message of the book is found in chapter 1, verse 27. In the NIV it reads, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And that's a good translation, and most of them will have some version of that. But there is hidden in that word a, a a picture. And so you could translate that instead of conduct yourselves, whatever happens, live like citizens. It's a verb form of the one that we see in verse 20 where the noun is our citizenship. Live as citizens. And so some of the freer translations, for instance, uh, the emphasized New Testament by be using your citizenship. The Berkeley translation, conduct yourselves as citizens. The good news, the, the, the Godspeed's um, translation, show yourself citizens. And this call, verses, chapter 1, verse 27 to about 218, builds around it. And the basic message is live like citizens. And what that means, of course, is by the norms and the standards, not of their Roman background, but of what it means to be in union with Jesus Christ. He calls them to remember who they are in Christ, that they are to live as citizens of eternity. And the chief characteristic of that is found in the first part of chapter 2. And I think it touches on the underlying problem. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort in his love, if any common sharing of the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and, one, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking out for your own interests, but each to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to use to his own advantage. 
the strife was beginning to tear them apart. It was beginning to percolate because people thought that they had um, power or control or some way. And they were fighting against each other who was in charge. We see that in that reading about those two ladies at the end that they mentioned. They were struggling about who gets to call the shots. It's, that would be our language. And so Paul reminds them that as citizens of eternity, the mindset that they were supposed to have is the same sacrifice, sacrificial love that Jesus demonstrated on the cross. They were not to seek their own advantage, but the advantage of one another, the advantage of the body. And that's, the, that's what it means to live as a citizen in Christ. To live of a citizen in eternity is to put that into practice in this current age. And so surrounding that first uh, command, 127 to 218, he gives a couple examples. He gives a biography of his own life, and he tells about Epaphroditus and Timothy. And a long section, and he does so because they demonstrate that mindset. They demonstrate what it means to be self-giving. And so when he comes to chapter 3, Again, there's a long section, chapter 3, verse 1, to 4, verse 9. He fills in what that means. The fundamental passion he has is for Jesus Christ. And we see that in his attitude towards things of the past. Whatever things were gained to me, he says, these things I count as loss. Everything is loss compared to knowing Christ. Not that I've already obtained it, he says in verse 12 of chapter 3, or have already arrived my goal, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me, brothers and sisters. I do not consider myself having arrived or taking hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. Join in following my example. So behind that is this notion of citizenship. To follow the example in verse 17, is to mimic, to copy, to imitate in some way. And so, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 4.16, he says, Therefore I urge you to imitate me. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And we know what imitate means, right? Most of us who have kids will know this. What do your children learn from you? Lots of things. And lots of the time you're proud of them, but sometimes they pick up habits that you wish they didn't, and you realize they're just copying you. We learn that way from it by watching someone else, and we imitate them. Paul is not saying, follow me because I've arrived, because he hasn't. He's on the way. Follow me because I follow Christ. And at the heart of it is this citizenship mindset of service to one another. He gives himself. And so, follow me, he says. That's the heart of this citizenship imperative he gives here. We celebrate our citizenship because it means following after Christ. And this, particularly, this passion for Christ. This, this isn't about rules. It's not about belonging or traditions or things. It's about knowing Jesus Christ and him alive. Everything that Paul did flows from that deep experience of the risen Christ and his love for him, and he's responding to that. So at the heart of this citizenship life we have is this living, powerful relationship with Christ. He's the one is at the heart of our citizenship. He's the one that's at the heart of our lives. Are we moved by him? If we are, we have the mindset of Christ, the self-giving love that he... Um, says is underneath all of these instructions to him. Not only does he say follow me, but he says keep an eye on uh, that's my space here. Keep, on, keep your eyes on those who live as we do, those who walk as we do. Pay attention to them, he says. Look at them closely. Follow closely what they are doing. It has the idea of taking note of and so, uh, chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is, of, of, is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned and received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. He's pointing to himself, follow me as I follow Christ, but he's saying among them there are people who are also following Christ. And he's mentioned those, Epaphroditus, who gave himself on their behalf, who went from Philippi to where Paul was in prison to serve and give himself for them. Timothy, they knew. 
He also embodied the same self-giving sacrifice, this love for the community. Pay attention to them. Watch them, he says, because part of our citizenship growth is to look at those who are following that road and pay close attention to them. That's part of this citizenship mindset, looking for those who embody the love of Christ and the passion for him, who embody citizenship living. Now you can see, of course, it's necessary because, well, not everybody does, do they? He's only talking about people inside the community. He's not talking about those outside. But sometimes what happens is we get together as a community, not everyone has that same passion for Christ. Sometimes people get caught up in religious activity or other things that stand in the way or try to use it for their own purpose. This happened in chapter 1. He speaks about some who have misunderstood. 115, it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition. And not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble. So there is within the community some who don't understand. In particular, you can see how he describes these group that you have to be watchful for. I told you before and tell you now again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. You can see this breaks his heart. What does he mean when he says many are enemies of the cross of Christ? They are hostile to the basic message. I mean, in one sense we can understand that because it seems so contrary to reason, doesn't it? How could someone crucified be God's solution to anything? How can there be life in someone who died? How can there be power and honor in someone who was beatly, beaten so badly? This was a Roman city. They were Roman citizens. They prided themselves on their accomplishment as a, as a nation. And in their culture, your standing was given by what you did and by how people responded to you. And so honor and place and position and power were a very important part of their lives. And he says, Paul says to them, that's upside down. There are those who are enemies of the cross of Christ because they do not start with Christ crucified. And so when we think about that, that's a reflection of all that Jesus did for us on the cross. His life on our behalf, the hope that we have, this transformation that comes in union with him. It is always about Christ crucified. There is no other way except union with him in his death and the resurrection on our behalf. And so there are some who want to lay that aside. They think they can get this some other way. They think they can get it by their leadership skills. They think they can get it by positions of power. They think that they can control it in some other way. And he says, you can't. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. That's why he says, he says I think here in three, chapter 3, verse uh, 3, um, no, pardon me, verse 2, watch out for the dogs, the evil workers, the mutilators of the flesh. These would have been people who would probably Jewish background who thought that circumcision still mattered and that if you were circumcised, you had standing with God. And he says, no, watch out for them. There are others, who, however, put different things. He describes them this way. Their destiny is destruction. The end result of their center on themselves, their unwillingness to put Christ in the center, is going to be destruction. Their God is their stomach. Isn't that a wonderful picture? It's a metaphor, of course, of eating and stuff, but the whole of life then gets centered around what's in it for me. And it's centered on this current moment. What's in it for me? The God of this world is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. What they value the highest, God does not. God considers what they value, this position and power, and as a thing of shame and dishonor. Now, sometimes in a church we find ourselves in circumstances where there are those who try to use that. Control, power, since old as humanity in a rebellion against God. So, he says, watch out for these. But the key word that he has in here is the fourth one. It sums up everything. Their mind is set on earthly things. Now I guess there is some struggle with this, of course, because we are called to live in this world, are we not? 
We have jobs, we have families, we have houses, we have responsibilities, and we feel them. We need to take responsibility for those and do the best with the resources God has given her to honor him. But it's different to set your mind on them. To set your mind on them means to put them at the very center of your life so that all your values, all our, our desires are rooted in what can be accomplished here and now. It's easy to push away the promises of God and the purposes of God and the work of God and the hope of God because we have this powerful age which we are part, which pushes in on us through its advertising, through its materialist success, through the prosperity that abounds for us. We can focus in on what can happen now in this world. But Paul says this world is fading away. It's important. This is where we get to follow Christ. This is where we get to know him. But it is not the end. And so here are a group of people, presumably in the church, connected with it in some way, who haven't gotten the fundamental spiritual principle that Jesus enunciated. Whoever seeks to save his life, you know what it says, right? Will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, will find it. That runs through scripture from beginning to end and it turns everything that we would naturally assume as a value upside down. It is only by letting go, putting Christ at the center, recognizing our citizenship and union with him that we have a way forward. Our citizenship, he says, is in heaven and it is marked by the self-giving love. That's what it looks like. And so we need that. We need those places, people in our life that demonstrate that. A good example of that came in the 1980s. Now I may be pronouncing this Japanese word wrong, but there was Mashushita Electric Company. They had an idea. They wanted to make a bread maker. And so they got their technicians together and they developed this machine and they, they tested it out and it would not work. They tried everything they could think of to get this machine to work and the outside was cooked hard and the inside was still raw. Well, one of their software developers had an idea. In the city, there was a, a hotel that was renowned for its bread. So this technician went there and signed herself up to learn bread making from him. And she watched what she did, what he did. And she paid attention to how he developed the dough, how he worked the dough. And then as she learned, how he, she took that skill back into the lab and they figured out how to do that with machines, with fingers that could manipulate the dough. Well, you know what happened from then. When they applied that, they produced a bread-making machine that had runaway sales that year. And the conclusion was, there are some things that can only learn by spending time with another human being. Howard Hendricks is an older Christian. Uh, he's not with us anymore, but um, a professor. He says this, every person should seek to have three individuals in their life. A Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. A Paul is the older man who is willing to mentor you, to build into your life. Not someone who's smarter or more gifted than you, but someone who's been down the road. Someone willing to share his, thought, his strengths and weaknesses, everything he's learned in the laboratory of life. Somebody whose faith you want to imitate. A Barnabas is a soul brother, somebody who loves you but is not impressed with you. That's a good way of saying it. Somebody to whom you can be accountable. Someone who's willing to keep you honest. Who's willing to say, hey, you're neglecting your wife. Or whatever the case may be. A Timothy is a younger person into whose life you are building. And then he mentions First and Second Timothy. Is that here is Paul, the quintessential mentor, building his life into his protege. Affirming, encouraging, teaching, correcting, directing praying. And then he asked the question, do we have those people in our lives? So we are citizens of eternity together in Christ. Our true citizenship is found in this practice of Christ in us in his overflowing self-giving love. But that necessitates people, community. So is our life marked like that? Is our community life like that? And do we have people within that community that we can imitate? walk with, get close to. Because we see Christ dwelling in them. Not we're trying to um, mimic them to uh, their personalities or their gifts, but just seeing Christ in them, a passion for him, and allow that person to change our life. Is there someone that we can come alongside and encourage? Someone that we can practice our citizenship with. It is the self-giving love that draws each other deeper into union with Jesus Christ. 
I know that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who empowers that whole process. So when Paul writes this to the group of people, he's reminding them that this tension they feel pulling them apart is because they've lost the center. They lost their citizenship, a sense of what it means to be in union with Christ. Now we know that that's true because again he says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And so the second thing to note here is we celebrate our true citizenship as we wait for his transformation. Verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, Brothers and sisters, whom you, who, who, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Sintishi to be of the same mind in the Lord. That being the same mind of the Lord as it goes back to chapter 2, which we saw. It's a word that's repeated over and over that, that I can't help wondering if the heart of that is those two ladies. That they lost sight of Christ at the center of things. So he reminds them, first of all, that our citizenship is in heaven. That is where we belong. He sometimes carries the idea of a colony, which again would make sense in Philippi because they were a Roman colony. The original settlers were all discharged Roman soldiers. They prided themselves. We as a people of God are like that. We belong to him. That's why you get places like 1 Peter. I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the Gentile that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The idea of being resident aliens. That means that, that on one sense we are called to live here. That's where God has placed us. In this world, at this time, in this place. But our real citizenship, our homeland, is the eternity with Christ. That's why you find places in Paul, for instance, you already died and were raised up with Christ. You're already sitting, seated in the heavenly places. That's where we belong. And one day we will be with him. But for the moment, we are here. And so we want to live here in light of there. To keep the mind of Christ in view, our citizenship in view, so that we live being aware that as we practice that, sometimes it'll work out well. But sometimes it's going to bump into the values and the structures around us that don't fit. So it always produces with tension within us. Our citizenship, he says, is in heaven. That's where we are headed. That's where we are going. And that is what the eternal kingdom is all about. And so we are rooted in there. We have another place. But as we wait, he says, we wait to be transformed. Isn't that a wonderful image? We wait. We anticipate. We eagerly wait, this one says, from there a savior. So there is a sense in which as we're, as we're going through this life, as we're practicing our citizenship, we know that it will not be complete until Christ comes. And so we lift our eyes from the present to that coming day when he will return. And we live in the light of that. But it's not just I'll be careful here. We're not just so focusing on that that we forget to live here. Part of anticipation and waiting is practicing it now. Almost like a rehearsal. We know what that's like at Christmas when we were little kids. Man, you've probably seen your kids do this. As the time comes, the children get more worked up in anticipation of the coming day, don't they? They can hardly sleep. They can hardly eat. So it's so full of anticipation that this day is coming. We are, should be like that in some way. That's who we are. We are waiting for the time when Christ comes and brings a kingdom in its fullness. We already have that life in us, working itself out already. And when he does come, he says he will transform us to make us just like himself. On that day it will be complete. This metamorphosis will take place. But we already know that at the current moment, that's what God is doing by his spirit, is it not? You know that verse we always use, we know that in all things God works together for good to those who love him, called according to his purpose. You know that verse? Do you know what the next one says? For whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That means that the good that he works is a transformation in the verses that follow. And this is the place that transformation begins. It will not be complete until he's done, but even now God is working whatever our circumstances are to make us just like Christ. Draw us deeper into the life of Christ. 
to experience that deep union which comes through him by the spirit within us. And so we anticipate that coming kingdom when we practice our citizenship. The self-giving mindset of love that undergirds this entire level. That's why he can say to these two women, I urge you to be like-minded. That doesn't mean think the same thing, but have this mindset of Christ who does not, he did not think what was to his own advantage, but was to our advantage. And he urged the believers to do the same. And he urges us to do the same. One day Christ will come. And that citizenship will be fully entered into. And will become complete in him. But until that day, we live in light of that. That's hope. So we anticipate the arrival of that kingdom. We live in hope of it. That's why he says in chapter 4, verse 1, stand firm. There's a great note of joy in this and hope in this, even if that word hope is not used, is it? Because he's anticipating that that's what's going to happen. So in light of that promise that the citizenship is going to come in its fullness, stand firm. Hold your ground. And that ground is found again in who Christ is. We are to be steadfast like children. Be on your guard, he says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, 4. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. We have this citizenship, which we share together with one another as we watch for those who live that way, and as we live in anticipation of that transformation. One day we shall be like him, and we shall see him as he is. And so we have to ask ourselves that question. Where are we being transformed this day? Because that's really what it's about, isn't it? We look to him. Daniel Taylor is a professor, and he, he writes this about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You know who he was, a, a Christian leader in Germany, uh, executed by the Nazis. And so he says about him that um, he was greatly moved by reading a book called Heroes of Every Day. It was filled with stories of courageous young people who, with selflessness, selflessness and clear thinking often saved others' lives. And apparently, shortly before Bonhoeffer's execution, he was reading one of those books, a book that explores the courageous character of some of the ancient figures. And so based on that, Taylor asked this question, can we doubt that Bonhoeffer's reading shaped his acting, including his decision to risk his life to save others? Ethics are more formed by the stories which we tell by the stories which we surround ourselves in than by the rules that are drilled into us. That's what we're talking about in citizenship. We're reminding each other of who we are in Christ. We're telling a story of what God has done for us in Christ. And the more we rehearse that story, the more we're drawn into that story, the more we grow in our citizenship. And we seek that. Robert Weaver is another Christian writer who said this, some time ago, I was biking in Michigan and met another biker who, like myself, was a professor of theology. In the course of our conversation by the side of the road, he said something I will never forget. Bob, all I really want in life is for the word of God to take up residence inside of me and form me into Christ's likeness. See what he says? All I really want in life is for the Word of God to take up residence in my life and form me into Christ's likeness. That's citizenship living, and that's what he's called us to do today. So, where are we being transformed? And where are we being pushed? Because more often than not, I hate to admit this, but I know it's true, the places that we are going to be transformed the most are not when things are good, are they? Not when everything's working out the way we anticipate them. It's going to happen when we are pushed, pushed, pushed. And that's where we'll find the faithfulness of God. And that's where we stand firm. And that's where our citizenship begins to live itself out in a deeper or more powerful way. And that's when we get to share it together. So on this long weekend as we celebrate Canada's birthday, we remember that we have a citizenship that is our true citizenship and is an eternal one. And as much as we can appreciate what's happening now, this we know, that one day he will come and bring us into his likeness and we shall be like him. In Christ, we celebrate our true citizenship as we await his transformation. I want to end with the story. 
this is written by another Christian leader, and he, sa he writes this. Um, he says that before, uh, before the colonists imposed boundaries on the, king, the kings of Laos and Vietnam, you know, the, the Westerners came in and they drew little lines on the map that suited Westerners, but they didn't necessarily reflect what was happening on the ground. So in these two kingdoms, the two kings had come to an agreement on how they should tax the border areas. It wasn't a line on the ground. This is what they worked out. This is what he said. Those people who ate short-grained rice, built their houses on stilts, and decorated them with Indian-style serpents were considered Laotians. On the other hand, those who ate long grain rice, built their houses on the ground, decorated them with Chinese-style dragons, were considered Vietnamese. The exact location of a person's home was not what determined his or her nationality. Instead, each person belonged to the kingdom whose cultural values he, he or she exhibited. So it is with us. We live in the world. But as part of God's kingdom, we are to live according to his kingdom's standards and values. We are to live according to his citizenship. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we thank you today. Thank you for your faithfulness and for your presence with us. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand and sing, my hope is built on nothing less. this time we'll receive the morning offering.
Let us pray. God our Father, we are grateful for your faithful goodness. We are your citizens, citizens of eternity living in time. And we acknowledge that all that we have comes from you as a stewardship has been entrusted to us to use, to honor you. It is our desire that our lives, all that we have, would glorify the Father through the Son by the Spirit. So we bring these gifts with deep, deep gratitude and ask that you would take them and use them to the praise of his name. Amen. Go now in righteousness of the righteousness of faith and live by God's just demands. Let nothing claim your devotion above the Lord, and count nothing of value above knowing Christ. Press on towards the ultimate prize of being one with Him. May God's perfect word revive your soul your soul. May Christ Jesus be your Savior and your rock, and may the Holy Spirit strengthen you and press ever onward. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's sing in conclusion, O Canada.